Welcome back to the How to Start a Cannabis Farm podcast. My name's Jared. I'm the same dude. Been here before. Be here again. I'm your host. And this time around, we are talking about what it's like to be a cannabis farmer mentally. Um, Most people think of it as just a physical thing, but obviously it is not. Um, To be a cannabis farmer, you're you're the modern pioneer um in some aspects sure in land you know uh property um but what i'm talking about more is in thought lifestyle belief morals um you're first off you're going against the grain uh the cannabis industry is counterculture um that's what it's been it's even and unfortunately even in the hemp world um and We'll get into that way later, but um, even in the hemp world, there's still a disconnect uh, culturally, and for you know, good or or evil, whatever, um, it exists. Uh, but regardless, as a cannabis farmer as a whole, we are all going against the grain. Um, it's not accepted everywhere. It's not accepted by everyone uh, for a variety of reasons. The majority of them. 99% of them educational. Um, some of them, the rest, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak to that 1%. Anyways, um, a pioneer is defined as a person who is among those who first enter or settle a region, thus opening it up for occupation and development by others. One who is first among the earliest in any field of inquiry, enterprise, or progress. Our fathers and our grandfathers, um, they were the the actual cannabis pioneers in horticultural and spiritual terms. Um, we, us, you, are the pioneers in the legal progress and enterprise, which requires an insane amount of trust and balls or uh, for women um fucking massive ovaries i mean gigantic ones you have to trust we have to trust uh the very agencies and thought producers um to respect our state and our votes and let's be real that hasn't happened um everywhere and so it's something that's continuing to happen but being pioneers in progress isn't necessarily something shared by all pioneers in the cannabis industry People like myself, um, I guess you can consider a cannabis refugee. Uh, I'm lucky enough to just be a witness to the progress that's been made by the pioneers of of Oregon and the pioneers in California and the pioneers of the cannabis industry um, that I'm lucky enough to be a part of on the Leland. Um, But for me personally, I feel like a pioneer for Texas. Uh, I know some of the bigger guys in the industry are from Texas, and <clears throat> they pine they pioneered that shit for people like me, you know. And uh, sorry, I I got shit going on. Um, it, it's great knowing that uh, you know, like old boy from Aficionado is from Texas and knows about Jay Prince. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should check out the podcast. Uh, listen to the most recent episode with him; it's really good. Um, but anyway, I. Even though I know I'm not the first for Texas, um, or even the first in my circle, I'm the first doing what I'm doing, which is starting my own farm, and then before making a dollar off of it, I instantly created a website and a platform to educate people um, and gave it away for free, you know, to put all my investment and my education back into the karmic circle, if you will, and try to give back just to show that um, that's how appreciative I am of the you know, what everybody's done before me and to try to make sure that, um, you know, if I'm able to do this, then it's my job as this sort of Texan pioneer to make sure other people can do that. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I, I know there's other companies that have actual campuses and curriculums, but, you know, you, fuck it. Go to school if you want to go to school. Um if you want to learn on your own, then you can do this and follow this and um, figure it out for yourself and save some time. 
I personally just don't want Texas to get left behind in the sea of bullshit that is the cannabis industry. And I'd rather help everybody get to where you need to be as soon as possible um, without you having to physically pay for all the marketing and middlemen and everybody trying to make a dollar off of every single purchase you make, which in the in terms of education is really um, how much bullshit you need to learn from all these different professors or teachers or whatever that, you know, they they have a structure that they have to meet and everybody has to make their dollars and down the line and blah, 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 blah. I got kind of out of track. But to get back on track, as farmers, um, we farm. And that's something that people don't really equate to um, mental anguish, if you will. But, you know, what we do is we prep, we grow, we harvest, we store, and we repeat. And the attention to detail is fucking gigantic. It is the biggest difference between good and great. And this, that's not nothing new. That's not groundbreaking. That's that's not, oh my God, quote me. Um, that's fucking everywhere. I mean, that's the difference between, you know, inches. Um, that's the difference between winning and losing. It's attention to detail. You know, good is smokable to some people, but a fuck no to others. Great is smokable to everyone and wanted by everyone. Your, your family's friends, boredom, business, recreational activities, sleep, desire, intention, um, all of those get tested. You'll never realize how bored you can be. You'll never realize the lack of contact with family or friends it takes in order to grow fantastic uh, cannabis. Um, and on the boredom end, um, things like trimming are just um, just daily shit, you know, standard daily shit. Um, <clears throat> business as a farmer, you still have to do business. You know, it's not just okay, let me do it. You still have to run your, your entire farm. You know, your farm is a company. Um, your recreational activities, you know, it, it's nice to have them. And if you can do them, great, because it's healthy for your mind. It's healthy for your body. Um, personally, I play competitive paintball. Um, paintball, just to reinforce that. And I know a lot of people think it's ping pong or some shit. Um, I play competitive paintball. And it's something that I love doing and I'd like to think I'm pretty damn good at it and better at it than any other sport that I've played. Um, you know, but because I'm farming a lot of my money and time goes into this and you know, hell I you know, moved from Texas to come out here to come do this. And so I left, you know, that entire program back in Texas and even trying to join a new one up here. It's, it's difficult because it's still two hours away and there's still the monetary aspect of it, you know, and this being a business, it's more, this is an investment and I'm not just investing like my time. I've invested my entire life. Like I fucking, I came out here, you know, I've, I've invested everything into this. Um, so I would love to have recreational activities, but at the same time, sometimes you can't and that will affect your psyche at some point. Um, lack of sleep, you know, um, a desire to get up and work. And it, and I mean, like everybody loves their job when they're doing this shit. If you're having fun, you should be, you know, you should love your job, but there's still, there's still like, um, you know, like a chemical formula for desire. And I mean like a desire to get the fuck up, a desire to work hard, a desire to, um, keep going when shit looks like shit. Um, a desire to get the fuck up and do things early. Um, and your intention. But when I mean like your intention gets tested, I mean it's easy to look at money and to think, oh, fuck, man. If 
I just did this this way, I can make a lot more money. But then all of a sudden you start going against this principle and this principle and this principle and this part of your own code and this part of your own code and another part of your own code. And then the product changes on a molecular level because you're not focusing on growing it for great product. You're focusing on growing for money. And so, again, when your intention changes, just like, you know, water freezing and, um, you know, water flowing through curves versus 90 degree angles, you know, water has memory. Um, and plants requiring water and, and, and whatnot, it, it's dumb to think that your intention isn't affecting. It, it's not whether it can or can't. It's, it's just, is it or is it not? Um, and there's a reason why the best pot is grown by people with great intentions. Um, the other thing is pulling a perfect run where all your transplants are timed perfectly. There's zero root bound. Um, the transplant shock is, is little to none. You got no pests, no mold issues. Everything's fucking kicking. Your microbes are just fucking munching away. You got no nutrient burn. All your ratios are proper. You're just, no deficiencies. You have enough light. That's That takes time. Um, and when it's dialed in, when you've got that shit dialed in, it's awesome. You know, like on the indoor side, people are pulling, you know, two and a half, three pounds of light. Like that's dialed in. But when it's not dialed in, when you're testing stuff or you're at a new um, a new property or, you know, you, you created a new terrace and therefore disturbed a or created a different microclimate um, or allowed a different wind flow to come onto your property. Um, you know, there's a lot of little factors that you have to think about. And so when you invest all of this in... And, and I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your energy. You know, for the sake of argument, each individual person's energy we'll say is the same. And I'm not, I don't mean like le energy level, but we'll just say like individual capacity. You know, everybody still has the same amount of output. Um, even if at that time, some people have more energy than others, it's like, well, some people are fucking, you know, v12s and other people are four bangers um you know some people's efficiencies are just different but when you put a year's worth of energy into something <clears throat> and you get shit on oh my god you know and then for the farmer it's like you get shit on right before thanksgiving right before christmas right before new year's and that entire time it's like when you're out here, it's, I mean, in, in some of these mountain areas, it's like, well, what do you do? You know, there's nowhere to really get a job that's going to pay for your farm over the fucking winter. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of headache that goes into this, um, you know, and just keeping, keeping the, the mental focus and, and strength to just buckle the fuck down and be like, you know what, having that thought isn't doing me any good and so let me just put that out the fucking window and and focus on what i can accomplish with this what can you salvage um having to to basically you know and think of it like driving if you drive fucking two hours and you're like fuck man this isn't the right way and you gotta fucking turn all the way back around and then try somewhere else and you still have to get somewhere at the same like by the same time you know, like, that's a lot of pressure, you know, and you're taking your car from fucking 60, 70 miles an hour to, like, 130, topping it out. You know, you put pressure on things. Um, and people crack. People crack under pressure. But the people that don't, that's that stress. Um, you know, it's the same thing when you're hunting for genetics. You stress plants out purposely, or you should. Um, see which ones crack first. You know, because that's ultimately, <clears throat> that's going to make your genetic the most popular. Uh, it's ability to survive and thrive in every environment possible. And that's you. As a farmer, you have to be that genetic. You have to survive and thrive no matter what the fucking harvest. You have to 
you know, and shit, I, I actually, um, I received a, uh, an email from somebody, um, that, you know, listened to this podcast and was talking about environmental disasters and that's fucking huge, fucking huge. Like, oh my God, <laughs> I have friends that they bought brand new greenhouses, 30 by 96, didn't think to brace them down enough. Well, that bitch rolled away. Um, rain, you know, the, the rain, it, it, oh my God. Not only can it completely ruin your entire crop, and, and just something to think about for those growing outdoor, um, you know, if the rain's coming and let's say you've got a, uh, a cultivar that's, um, that's really susceptible to mold, um, you know, the, the overall, <clears throat> excuse me, the overall humidity atmospherically, that's really your issue. Um, you know, because I mean, you can cover it up with, um, with hoops and shit. And I think that would probably be your, your best cheapest alternative, um, considering everything. Um, but you know, that's just something you're gonna have to deal with and something to factor in. If you get a lot of, um, you know, mold and shit in a specific area and you just really love those genetics, well, maybe you need to start hunting through them. Um, that's what I would do at this point as the, as the cannabis industry evolves and grows, microclimates are going to become a much bigger factor to people, you know, it, it's, and to growers, I should say, um, it'll be nice, you know, when things are shipped everywhere. Uh, but if you want to compete as a small farmer in your area, you're going to have to be able to grow the same strains like up here in Oregon, I'm going to have to be able to grow the same strains that were, you know, um, sifted down in fucking San Diego. And the only way to do that is to basically, well, start fucking searching for genotypes and, and finding different ones that are, um, that just work better for this area. But again, in the meantime, just get some PVC, put up some hoops, um, cover everything up. That should do you something. Um, it's better than nothing. <clears throat> Ideally, though, the bud structure you should be fine if it's tight it shouldn't allow too much water to seep in um, a lot of people they go out there with um, what do you call it fucking leaf blowers you know and, oh my god it's kind of funny you live out in the mountains and when it's raining you just kind of be quiet and go outside and listen and it's just <laughs> it's just people fucking all over the valley just firing up their leaf blowers um, there's, there's mixed reviews on it. Um, you know, some people say that you're blowing the fucking, the, uh, the rain directly into the bud and you're shoving it in there. And some people say, you know, they were doing it and they would always get, bu uh, butter rot and mold and, um, and they stopped and just decided to let it go and they, you know, barely got anything. Um, you know, <laughs> do what you want to do. Um, for me and as a farmer, energy is energy. And so if the plant's not really set up to, uh, grow in the area, you know, well, you just don't fucking grow it. But if you have to grow it and you have to deal with this shit, um, I wouldn't be fucking going out there blowing everything. Um, just cover it up. That seems to be the best use of your energy. Cover it up once and just walk away. You shouldn't have to go out there multiple times and blow it off and then go out there and blow it off and go out there and blow it off. Um, that's money adding up. You know, At the very least, with the hoops, you can keep the hoops. Um, you don't have to pay somebody, So just from a monetary perspective. Now, when it comes to snow and shit getting frozen... Um, check your snow load I've seen and uh, I, god I can't remember I think it's Jay Plant Speaker on Instagram I think his uh, greenhouse last season fucking buckled um, because of snow um, snow load make sure if you're going to spend money on a greenhouse obviously check that and determine that that is the right amount uh, that you need um, shit I, I got really nothing to say on that. You know, just try to keep the fucking snow off. Um, 
go out there with a broom or, or a stick or a, a rope or something and, and just try to keep the snow off of it. You know, I'm not talking about like an inch, but you know, make sure there's, make sure it doesn't fucking build up. Um, yeah, take your, I mean, if you have an opportunity, take your, your cover off. Um, always take your cover off, you know, when you're done with it, just avoids weathering, you know, keep it around longer. Um, and as for fires, fuck, I can't, I, I can't say anything about fires. Um, I'm just sorry for everybody that's fucking lost everything. You know, I, I don't like, I don't know. It's, it's fucking devastating to hear this shit happen. Like I've had, I've had a buddy of mine lose like two, three of his properties, you know, and what did survive, um, it was fucking okay. It, the fire came so close that it basically, or not necessarily the fire, that the heat got so fucking hot that it vaporized all, uh, all remaining terpenes. So there was no smell, you know, and yeah, um, you know, people's animals die, people die, you know, there's all kinds of crazy, and I'm not going to even go into the reasons for different fires. Um, what I'm talking about are just forest fires, um, shit where kids are fucking lighting off fireworks and out in the mountains or, um, campfires get out or controlled burns get out of control, you know, shit like that. Um, trying to keep enough water on hand, that's fucking tough. You know, a lot of people, they don't think about the heat overall. I mean, people's cars fucking melt. Um, you know, and, and it's it just crazy shit. I mean, you guys saw that Toyota that was on the news. Um, whole bottom of it was a fucking toasted, but, you know, dude went out there and saved people and shit. Um, when you're trying to keep the area around your property clear, um, well, and first off, if you listen to, you know, I don't know, the actual how to start a cannabis farm um, part, the steps one through 12 or whatever, um, that goes a little bit more into detail on um, what's required uh, by the fire department. Um, but just things to, th you know, <clears throat> think about as you're looking around your property and trying to assess your own fire danger. Um, you know, if you have any dead trees, um, you know, in the area or, um, loose ground cover or, or just you know, loose soil or anything like that, anything that might fall, um, you know, look up and you know, say it's like 30 feet tall. Well, all right, that might fall on a 30 foot, um, radius. So, you know, factor that in, you know, if your tree, you know, like my house would get fucking demolished. My house would be done for, um, just because of where it is and the proximity to the trees and, um, in this whole area, you know, there, there's, there's only so much, um, you know, I've had a friend of mine when the fire came through one of their properties, uh, the only thing they could do was run into the reservoir because, you know, they could basically hide in the water. Um, so them and the dogs ran into the reservoir and just hung out there while the fire burned up everything, burned the house, burned the vehicles, everything. Um, fucking just crazy shit. Uh, but you know, besides a farmer and you know, besides just, you know, farming and having to deal with that type of stuff. Um, oh yeah, by the way, on the fire and, and the snow and, and floods and all that shit, um, check your insurance insurance companies are really fucking snaky and you know let's say like let's say the fucking wind blows a tree over and the tree fucking knocks something like uh i don't know just something out you know and that hits like a gas pipe i don't know and catch your shit on fire just the worst you know they'll be like oh well no that was an act of god or maybe they do cover that maybe they don't maybe they don't have wind insurance and they're able to basically argue that well your policy isn't covered because of this um think about that as you're moving forward it's something that you know i i 
I'd like to say that I've put more research into, but I haven't. Um, but as I'm talking about it, it's something that I'm realizing I need to fucking do. So, yeah, I should probably do that. Anyways, um, the mind of the cannabis farmer goes beyond just the farmer as well. Um, cannabis farmers are entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneur has about uh, 30, 40, 50 jobs besides the cannabis farmer. So just to list off some shit for fuck's sake, um, you're in charge of sales, you're in charge of marketing, you're the web designer, you're the creative department, you're human resources, you're R&D, you're the finance department. Um, and each one of these jobs can be its own day or own week which means you're putting everything else back that many days or that many weeks, which fucks it all up. Um, and I mean that oh, so fucking passionately. People don't realize that that's why entrepreneurship moves so fucking slowly because when we've got like 30, 40, 50 fucking jobs, I'm doing every fucking job to the maximum ability that I have. <laughs> But it's even more frustrating because I know that I have other shit to do and I can't fucking do it. And as entrepreneurs, farmers, whatever, you're still competitive to some extent. And so you're always, you should be just fucking looking forward and looking down and just taking steps. But everybody would be lying if they didn't use their peripherals a little bit because that's what they're for. It's to fucking look to the sides without losing focus. And it's beautiful when you see other people with their shit together because it's a beautiful dance. It's a beautiful, beautiful dance. Like, fuck the competitiveness. When you see skill, when you see talent, oh, oh I fucking love it. I love it. But as a competitive motherfucker, you're just, oh, I fucking hate this person. You know, and I'm emotional about this. Because I've dealt with it the past, you know, 10 years in the professional realm. But, god damn it, my first job, I was mowing fucking lawns back in Texas, like, as a little kid. And I was making bread. I was making bread. It was like, it was like, uh, what was the fucking, like, 25 for the back, uh, 15 for the front, 30 for both. I was fucking hustling. And these little fucking little fucks, kids, these little fucking fucks, <laughs> These little fucking kids, <laughs> these little fucking kids, little fucking hoodlum motherfuckers that I was friends with, kind of, um, they goddamn had some, some fucking nerve to take down my fucking sign off the, the goddamn fence behind the mailbox and put theirs up. Oh, boy, I swear to God, I was furious. So I printed up an even bigger one. <laughs> And I snatched that shit off and I stapled mine up with twice as many staples. Oh, I was furious. But, you know, that shit, I mean, that, for me, it, it's, I've been dealing with this shit since job one, like year five of my life. You know, uh, it's been fucking crazy. Um, you know, but as entrepreneurs, we take financial losses all the time and we still have to fucking go forward. And that's tough. Um, it, it's tough when you're ready to go forward and you have your fucking gear and drive to go forward, but you don't have the gas to go forward. And you're like, God damn. You know, like I've financially been set back pretty badly this year from some other shit related to my other company. And. Like, it's fucking put a lot of stuff on stall. And there's not much you can do. I mean, like, the motions are, are, are already in play. Um, you know, things are happening. But it's not fast enough for me. You know, but there's a bureaucracy that you're dealing with. There's other people in line. There's lag time built into the fucking system. You know, it just is what it is. It, you know, so it's... It's frustrating when you know, you're starting out a farm and your income comes from another place and that gets devastated for uh, this reason or that reason. 
you know, and it, again, it, it, it's emotional. Uh, but it doesn't matter. All you know is you won't fuck. And you got to get more gas then. So you just put the car in park or just put that bitch in neutral and, hey, just let's just keep pushing until we get to the gas station. That's what you do. Put that bitch in neutral. You know, yeah, you might go back a little bit. Hey, but at least you can go forward. You know, you don't have to push the whole fucking engine. You know, the whole goddamn drive. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a fucking mechanic. Anyways. Um, but it's nice, though, because you know you'll get to that gas station eventually. You just gotta know where the gas station is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, something else that I, I guess I haven't really talked about is um, this isn't on the entrepreneurship route. This is... <sighs> I guess more on the mental health of the mental side of growing cannabis. Um, I don't know if anybody really talks about mental health. I know to some people it's taboo. Other people are fucking praising me right now for bringing up mental health. Um, I'm talking anxiety, depression, fucking the works. Uh, Depending on what you're doing in the cannabis industry, whether it's black market or rec or medical um, or hemp, um, there's still a market for your product elsewhere. You know, hemp farmers are having their fucking product stolen because somebody thinks it's weed or somebody can sell it as weed and it's readily available. It happens. But, you know, as a cannabis farmer, um, you move to the middle of nowhere for security. You put up, you know, six to ten foot fences for security. You have multiple dogs for security. Some people have guns for security. You put up cameras and alarms all over the forest and your farmland for security. Shit, you might even put it up on somebody else's property for security. You may get some sleep, but you're always on guard for security if you think a car is following you you go out of your way to make sure it is or it isn't you have to know for security you don't tell a soul that isn't in it to win it with you where you live for security you don't go to the bar because shit you might drink one too many beers and somebody might buy you a shot and Loose lips sink ships. You don't talk to women. Or if you're a chick, you don't talk to dudes. Or if you're fucking either or, you don't talk to the same sex. Because they'll wait till you're asleep and then text their friends to come rob you. And you don't make any actual friend friends because those are the motherfuckers that that girl's gonna fucking call to come rob you. And they already know where you live. Life as a cannabis grower, it's not what people think it is. Um, A lot of people are getting in this for money. And I guess... I guess everybody gets, you know, to do whatever they want. But a lot of people are... uh, They're going to have a rude awakening when they fucking see this. It is not what you think it is. But it's fucking amazing. Don't now, now. Now, let me. And I didn't write any of this part down. So this is just off the top. Let me talk about the beautiful part about it. When you learn to farm cannabis, when you are a cannabis farmer, there's a consistent educational, um, I guess, play going on in front of you in your life. You may not know it's an educational play, um, but it is. There's opportunities everywhere for you to learn, and for you to progress as a cannabis farmer, you have to learn. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. But as you learn how to farm, you begin seeing similarities between the plant and the soil and society. And it's... There's a pleasure that comes from understanding the way that things work. 
um, I made a comment to my partner that uh, you know the more that you understand, the less magic there is. And I think that's true. I, I, I still do. Um, you know, a, as you find out, and by magic, I don't mean like good magic or bad magic. I just mean a force or a process that we don't understand that allows things to happen. You know, so if you were to flick a lighter in front of somebody in the Stone Age, um, it, it allows you to kind of see not only the way the world works, but the way you work as a person, as a network as a, of um, microbes and beings. It allows you to realize that your head and your body are one and not your head and your body. It allows you to be regrounded with uh, with the world because that's what you're doing. Your purpose in life at that point is almost to how do I say this? To be a, a <laughs> to be a mechanic of energy your your job is to not only fix but to create and to allow things to be what they are um, and specifically this plant if there's a bad plant if there's something wrong with it you're supposed to fix it um, and by energy I mean what cannabis does and, and what it has the potential to do and just because it doesn't do something doesn't mean that it doesn't do it. it just means we haven't figured out how to how to harness it and anybody that's farming cannabis can truly tell you i mean there's an energy that, that comes from it. i mean what it does what it does for people um i mean it saves lives it, it draws people to it um but even that as a as an extension of earth you know physically and then and having that connection with all the you know the fungi and microbes that are the soil um, and all of the memory that exists within the soil from the you know hundreds of thousands of millions of years of vegetation and trees and um, us beings animals um, other microbes worms that all lived there you know and died there I mean it, it's it's impossible to not have a lesson from this and enjoy it because you might get taught and you know you might get sat down but there's a pleasure to it and it, it's it's not something that you can just do it, it, it's its own school um, and so because of that you almost have to be a little bit more open-minded you have to come to cannabis asking questions you can't just expect it to teach you. You have to want to know. And if you want to know, it'll show you. Oh my God. You know, if the the variety of cultivars and the, the different effects that they have, if that doesn't have the potential to teach you enough, um, you really got to dive into soil biology and soil science, the soil food web and fungi and and all of it and realize that's all we are um you know in the same way that microbes may not actually have the ability to see what they're doing um as far as their role in the overall scheme of things being you know they're eating the this decaying matter which is breaking you know this you know the, the matter down for the plants to fucking eat and then absorb and blah 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 um all they know is, look, there's food. I'm going to fucking grub. I'm starving. It's 2.30. I missed breakfast. Fuck, man. You know, they may not know that. And in the same way, we may not know that. We may not know exactly what the fuck we're doing. Um, but this is our job. And as such, um, I have to believe that what we're doing um, is something that, you know, as individuals, maybe, uh, but we are supposed to be doing. I don't know, you know, what plant we're growing, if that is even it. 
Um, but again, it, it teaches you stuff and it teaches you that, you know, a lot of the bullshit that we go through in life and a lot of the, the little things are just that they're just little shit, little micro drama that only exists at this level because nothing else is small enough to give a fuck about it. The same way, like, would you really care if, like, the microbes that you were using, you know, were, were dating other microbes outside of their fucking... <laughs> it's just something stupid, you know, and, and it just puts things in perspective, like, what the fuck are we doing? Let's just, let's just get down to grubbing, and, like, let's just fucking eat the best food we can eat, and then, you know, do something else. Because you realize it's like, well, if it's all just drama, then we have the ability to change that. So let's just fucking do something else. Let's, let's focus on a better world. You know what I mean? That's all I'm getting at. Um, but you know, this, this, this cannabis farming thing, it, it's something I think everybody should try, um, at some scale. It doesn't have to be large scale. Um, but I think people will instantly gain respect for, uh, the amount of work that goes into something like this. Um, and again, I don't mean physical because there's dedication involved and dedication, dedication is, you know, it's, it's a belief in something. It's a belief that this will work out and you have to, you're basically giving up other things for that belief. And I think, I think when people realize that it'll, um, a, the price of cannabis might actually stop uh, going through the floor, um, but B, the cannabis farmer will begin to be looked at and appreciated more um, as an artist rather than just a farmer. Um, but that's only if they decide, we decide that uh, we don't want to be farmers. Farmers can be for hemp, um, artists can be for hemp as well but again there has to be there has to be intention there has to be craft there has to be um, attention you can't really be an artist on a tractor mowing acres I'm, I'm just being serious that's just not the way it is um, you know you might put all your time into the entire field but I mean, if you ain't making fucking Mona Lisa out of that bitch, then I don't know what your artistry is about. Give you props for setting up the property. That's fucking artistic as shit. Setting it all up, making it functional, having the logistics work out, like that's fucking dope. Um, but it's going to be the small scale farmer that's going to allow this to happen. Um, and that's always the way that it's been. It's always been on the, the small guy that actually takes time and, and care and passion um, and takes this to that next level where, you know, you have artists and cannabis, which I guess is technically where we're at now. But anyways, um, shit, it's a little shorter one, not quite, maybe long, I don't know. Um, thanks for listening. How to Start a Cannabis Farming Podcast.